And now you can. Great, Dave, there you go. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, super. Uh, my name is Dave Worthington, Chief of Science and Resource Management, and I've been here since the beginning of November. Um, so I'm still getting my feet wet. Um, literally, I'll be getting my feet wet in about 10 days when I go in the river with you all. I come here after seven years at Virgin Islands National Park, Virgin Islands Coral Reef National Monument, um, which is an extraordinary place. Um, and I confess that in the middle of February, I was perhaps questioning my decision to come here, um, but I am ultimately happy to have replaced palm trees with ponderosa and, and pinon. Um, prior to Virgin Islands, I was at Lassen Volcanic National Park for about two years. And before that, I was at um, Capitol Reef National Park in Southern Utah for about 15 years. And so coming to the Grand Canyon is really coming home for me. Um, I'm really excited to be back on the, on the Colorado Plateau, a little bit further south than I was before. Um, and so working with and meeting a new group of people. Very briefly, as a chief of SRM, um, I work with an extraordinary staff of around 32 um, talented permanent and term staff. Um, that number grows during the summer um, when we bring on lots of seasonals to do our work. And so all of us in the division, I think, are really excited to start moving downstream together. I am trying to go to the next, there we go. First, I wanna say thank you for everything that you do. In my career in the Park Service, which spans over 20 years now, it's become very clear that, that our partners um, are what allows us to do what we need to do in the ground. And in particular, guides and outfitters um, are our ears and eyes in the ground very often. We're not, not out as often as we would like to be. And so it is the guides that are often the people that are interacting with our visitors, educating visitors, helping to protect the resources. And particularly here at the Grand Canyon in the corridor, the guides allow our visitors to have an experience that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have. Your typical visitor is not gonna be able to come to the park and run the Colorado River. They can't do that, but for the guides. And so it's an opportunity um, to make contact with our visitors, to educate them and show them this extraordinary resource. And as Marie suggested, you know, it helps, um, it brings more people into the fold that make the connection to the park service, to the parks and to, and to Grand Canyon. And I also want to say thank you for me having me along um, both at this um, presentation and especially when we get on the river in a couple of weeks. This is a laundry list. It's an incomplete laundry list. It's just some of the things that we do in the Division of Science and Resource Management. It's everything from counting fish to counting bats, indigenous affairs, river missions, visitor use management, wilderness management, cultural resources. It runs the gambit. Virtually everything that we do in the park touches science and resource management. I wanna reemphasize what the superintendent said yesterday, which is our goal to continue to incorporate tribal nations into what we do. I heard it from several in the call yesterday, very eloquently, um, that this is tribal land and we need to acknowledge that and respect that. When I first came to the Park Service some 25 years ago and actually came here for a training, I don't remember that being part of the conversation at all. And in my mind, at least for me, I think I'm still on the steep part of the learning curve in terms of thinking that way, in terms of bringing indigenous science and traditional ecological knowledge into the day-to-day -day work that we do in the division. Um, but I also think that compared to when I started many years ago, um, we've made a lot of progress. 
And I'm excited about that. I'm excited to have a leader and at people, a superintendent, who is making this a really important and high priority for the park. So let's talk about resources. We have fish and bighorn sheep and birds and bats and cultural resources. And as I talk about these things and the things that we want to do, because I know I'll forget to mention as I go along, virtually none of this work do we do alone. We do it with partners. We do it with the guides. We do it with an amazing amount of support from GCC. Um, other agencies, the tribes, nothing we do, do we do alone. But I wanna start kind of at the 10,000 foot level, almost um, literally, um, talk about one of the resources that we deal with, bison management on the North Rim. Right now, there are just over 200 bison on the North Rim. Rim. That's a little more than we would like. Um, bison can, can cause a lot of ecological damage in large numbers. And so last year, uh, prior to my arrival, we were working on capturing and removing bison um, delivering them to tribes in the Midwest and the East, and also doing some culling, um, skilled volunteers that would come in and, and shoot bison. Um, I think we transferred, we captured and transferred to tribes around 36 bison, and I think called six bison. And we're going to continue the capture this coming year. Um, we're not certain yet about the culling. We're still working on that. And this is another project that we cannot and will not do alone. It involves other agencies, it enjoy, involves the tribes and particularly Arizona Game and Fish. The bison are mostly up in the North Rim. Um, they rarely get down to the canyon as I understand it. The photo on the right shows a few that have wandered down. I suppose if they get all the way down to the river, um, we might start calling them water buffalo. And I think I'm glad everyone's on mute. Citizen science, we chatted about at, at the beginning of this session, um, something that I know that the guides have done in the past and are very interested in standing up again. Um, it's been shut down for a few years for a variety of reasons. Well, we're gonna to try to stand it up this year. Um, starting with something simple, um, using bighorn sheep observations, um, involving all visitors so that from the rim to the river, anyone can make bighorn sheep observations and provide us that information. We're go moving to a web -based, web and app-based system, we hope, um, for recording this information. Um, and that will allow us um, to do it most more efficiently, um, we'll get rid of paper. And that's one of the things that I look forward to chatting with the, the guides about when I'm on the river is how best we can implement this. And bighorn sheep is just a start. Um, we're wanting to expand it and do more. Similarly, stewardship efforts. Um, we want to stand up again and we were doing it on this trip. We will be doing a service um, service work, doing some control, I'm sorry, doing some work on invasive species at at least one location on the upper portion of the river, and then doing some prep work on the lower stretch um, as we try to identify other locations where we want to do work. And those locations are based largely on the observations that the guides have provided to us. So it's another example of us working together, um, trying to determine um, what are the highest priority locations uh, that we're going to work on. And I'll also tell you briefly that I'm really jealous for those of you that are doing the upper um, uh, upper trip. Jason Nez of my staff uh, will be on that trip. Um, Jason's a wonderful man, a great biologist. I'm sorry, archaeologist uh, in the cultural program who works a lot with fire. And Jason is with the Navajo Nation. And so he's able to offer a really great perspective on things in the corridor. 
Very quickly, there are condors in the corridor. Part of what I'm wanting to do today is talk about things that we're likely to encounter during our trip. We will see condors. 30 years ago, there were only 22 condors left in the wild. Now there are over 600 throughout the Southwest and Mexico, a great many of those in, in, um, in Arizona, and they are in the canyon. We will likely uh, see a nesting um, condors when we're in the when we're on a river river trip. And this is also another project that we think we're probably going to want to ask for citizen science observations to help us with information on condor distribution. Climate change affects all of us. I think there's no resource that we talk about um, in SRM um, that doesn't include climate change. And I think everybody on this call knows what's going on. Temperatures are going up, precipitation is going down. You know, we've got a wildfire in Colorado right now. I was commenting to a friend that it's, it's August and March in Colorado. Oops. I think many of us know the impacts and I'm, I'm fortunate that many others on this call today are gonna to be going into greater detail and have a better understanding than I do, but water availability, river flows, wildlife severity, rain shifts in, in animals. Um, it runs the gambit how climate change is affecting things. And no place is that more apparent, I think, in the, in the park than on the Colorado River. We see, and we will see, and I have heard about, but I look forward to seeing for myself, uh, some of the impacts. Um, and, and we saw some photos at the very beginning of how it's affecting beaches. Um, washing out beaches. Other beaches are suddenly encroached by vegetation. We literally are having difficulty, as I understand it at times, um, finding places for our, um, our folks in the river uh, to camp. Um, cultural resources are exposed. Archaeological resources are at threat because of low water flows and how the river is managed. Dave, you got about one minute. Okay. Our native fish population is, is under threat and my timing is off. So I'm just gonna run through this really quickly. Um, we'll talk more when I'm on the river. I'll talk very briefly about bats. We'll talk more in the river. I can't do a talk without talking about bats because that's my background. And I'm sorry for cutting it short, but I'll just go through quickly. I wanted to talk real quickly, something we'll see in the river at the very end of the trip. We have trespass cows that we'll be looking at and trying to manage. And just my last slide is, I call this unintended consequences. We did a really good thing in putting water stations on the south rim. We started in the north rim, now we're in the south rim. One of the unintended consequences is that um, it's a nuisance attraction for wildlife. They like drinking our water. And so you're still free to get water in your water bottle. It just may have a little bit of elk slobber on it. That's a public health issue and a lot of other issues associated with it as well that we're trying to address. And I'm sorry for um, screwing up my time. There are more things I'd like to talk about, um, but I look forward to chatting about, chatting about these resources when I'm with you on the river. And, that's where I'll end. Thanks, Emily.